As a senior editor of the science journal Nature, Henry G. follows the leading research in anthropology. The remains we have are very scarce and very meager, and that means that there are probably lots of different species that existed, that came into being, that lived for hundreds of thousands of years and then became extinct, and we know nothing about them. And all you need is just one to completely blow apart your well-entrenched, comfortable idea of the linear progress of evolution. Could the hobbit be that species? It certainly challenges key assumptions that the savannas of Africa were the sole cradle of humankind and that evolving a bigger body and brain is what let us leave the cradle and spread around the world. Could evolution have taken a different path than anyone imagined? There are some very big things at stake here and it raises questions which would destroy for some people, a huge amount of work. Some of our critics find this hard to swallow. It doesn't fit with their preconceived ideas about the onward, upward progress of human evolution. And Homo floresiensis has no business being here 12,000 years ago. To make sense of the surprise, scientists are trying to determine where the hobbit fits in our evolutionary tree. This is one of the most challenging aspects of the find. In arriving at this creature, what was the ancestor? To explain Homo floresiensis, we have to know what it evolved from. And given where it lived, one ancient species must be considered a prime candidate. Its official name is Homo erectus, but it has also been known as Java Man, because that's where it first turned up on the island of Java, near Flores. At Leiden University in Holland, two specialists in Indonesian fossils have come to view the original Homo erectus skull. When this fossil was discovered in the late 1800s, John DeVos and Robin Dennell know that it was as controversial as the Hobbit is today. The significance of Erectus is that it's supposed to be the first type of human ever to live outside Africa. That according to long-standing views, around about 1.8 million years ago, it left its African homeland and dispersed across Asia and eventually reached Java. That's why it's so significant. But could Homo erectus, tall and big-brained, really have evolved into a pint-sized version of itself? John DeVos believes it could, because strange things happen to animals on islands. On the islands, you see the phenomena that large mammals become small and small mammals become large. And nowhere is the so-called island rule more evident than on Flores. Rats once grew as big as rabbits, lizards became Komodo dragons, and pygmy stegodon elephants the size of cows evolved from ancestors eight feet tall. If you want to live somewhere that doesn't have many nutrients, it helps if you're small. You can still get a little bit smaller and survive if there are no big predators around. Facing few predators and limited resources, species isolated on islands grow or shrink to survive. The Dutch Museum is full of such examples. Here I have the pygmy stegodon from Timor. Wow, isn't that small? Just shows what happens on islands, doesn't it? The same evolutionary pressures that produced pygmy elephants turned Homo erectus, DeVos believes, into a hobbit. All those characters of the hobbit you can explain in the island phenomena. So you're saying that's an island endemic form? Yes. But Denel doubts Homo erectus evolved into a hobbit. The island effect, he argues, has never been known to shrink a human brain. 
and CAT scans of the hobbit's bones lead Bill Jungers to the same conclusion. He too sees no evidence of a shrunken Java man. I'm less and less persuaded that this is some kind of dwarf Homo erectus. I, I suspect that we're looking at an ancestry that even predates Homo erectus. The Hobbit is forcing scientists to consider a strange possibility. The more interesting scenario is that the Hobbit was already small when it arrived, and perhaps his own ancestry goes back to something at the very base of the evolution of our own genus. Something like Australopithecus. Approximately Hobbit-sized in both body and brain, it is one of our most primitive bipedal ancestors. The most famous Australopithecus is Lucy, a skeleton found in Ethiopia. She's at least three million years old. Other such remains have shown up across Africa, but never outside of it, until perhaps now. But how does the Hobbit measure up to Lucy? To find out, casts made of her bones were shipped to Jakarta. Bill Jungers compared the two skeletons. He first tried fitting the bone at the base of Lucy's spine to the Hobbit's pelvis. I was shocked. I'm amazed by how similar Lucy is to LB1. Despite being separated by millions of years, pieces of the skeletons fit together easily. The humerus is almost identical in length. The femur is almost identical in length. The pelvic morphology is now turning out to be very similar in size and shape. Could the hobbit be a descendant of an Australopithecus like Lucy? To many scientists, the idea is heresy. They always assumed it took large brains and bodies to make the arduous journey out of Africa. But the reality is it's looking more and more like an Australopithecine escaped from Africa. No time recently, two million years ago, maybe three million years ago, and then gets stranded out there on this tiny little island, leaving no remains anywhere else throughout Southern Asia, apart from this one cave that we just happened to dig in. And that might imply that there is in fact a hidden Asian lineage of hominins that is only recorded so far in Flores at the very end of its trajectory. Denel believes traces of this lineage may be found in the vast plains that once extended from Africa to Asia, a region he calls Savannistan. We know animals crossed it, so why not early humans? Those Asian grasslands are in fact far older and more extensive than those in Africa. And so one could advance the argument that maybe the Asian grasslands also played a major part in the early part of our own evolution.